So I'll start by saying what an absolute privilege to be here today and present um, insights on a data set that I think is an, is an enormous step forward for our community. It's an absolute privilege to be here, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'll maybe start with the premise that I think has been really clear through the day that UK Biobank is an absolutely transformative biomedical resource. Nowhere more is that true than in drug discovery and development, both in the scale, the depth, the quality of the data, but also in the accessibility of the data. I think UK Biobank has set a trend that make the usual excuses hard to offer and why we cannot make data available to the community. <clears throat> so I'll take a brief chance to share how and why we use these data at GSK um, and the uses to which we put them, and that's in disease understanding, hypothesis generation, um, and biomarker identification, and disease prediction to identify individuals we think are at higher risk of disease. And then maybe the example I'll touch on most today is in causal inference and how we use these data to support target identification and portfolio progression. And of course, specifically, I'll offer some preliminary insights from our analyses of half a million whole genome sequences linked to that broad and deep phenotypic data. <clears throat> so the background I'll start with is that drug discovery and development is really hard. Um, depending on the timeline at which we start, um, the vast majority of the, the drugs that we take into clinical development are likely to fail, and that number is around 90%. So even the drugs that we take into clinical development after years spent preclinically, nine out of 10 of them will not see a patient and benefit a patient. So the hypotheses that we have um, don't turn out to be true. So anything that we can do to shift the dial in increasing our probability of success in developing safe and effective medicines is extremely valuable. And thankfully, one of those things is we can use genetics. So this is some work done by colleagues of mine at GSK that showed that drugs with genetic evidence are twice as likely to be successful um, as those without genetic evidence. And essentially, in this analysis, they said, here's a region of the genome that encodes a particular protein that's a drug target. Does that region of the genome contain variants that are linked to the similar disease, the indication for that drug target? And we and others have updated these analyses, and what we've shown is that not only are they twice as likely to be successful, but we're, we're really confident in the genetic variant and it's linked to disease. That number can be three, four, and five times more successful. Now, to be able to do that, the, our ability to do that is predicated on a foundation that requires two things, really, and that is number one, genetic variants that we can confidently link to the function of a gene, i.e., it might be that a loss of function variant, so a variant that prematurely truncates a protein is a really good mimic for pharmacological inhibition of that protein. And then when we have those variants, we need to have the ability to link them to a large number of disease phenotypes across the disease phenome in a very large sample. And I mentioned that UK Biobank has tra been transformative. Um, it really has in our ability to bring these genetic insights to support drug discovery and development. Um, and it's absolutely changed the paradigm in which we bring genetics. And, and I present here an illustrative example. This was work that I started doing in around 2014 when I was in academia at Cambridge. We identified a low frequency coding variant in GLP-1R that was associated with lower fasting glucose, thinking that it might then be a useful proxy for pharmacological, uh, pharmacological targeting of GLP-1R. Um, we then asked, well, can we take that variant and test it against um, disease phenotypes? We identified the variant was associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes and, uh, and cardiovascular protection. And the way that we did that really at that time was we did what one could do. We started firing out emails. And this process to be able to generate this one figure here took around 18 months and over a thousand emails. And there's absolutely no hint of exaggeration there. I did count the emails before I left Cambridge. There were over a thousand. When we come to doing that in UK Biobank, when it arrives soon after I joined GSK, um, if you squint hard enough, I'm sure you would agree that these figures look much the same. This figure now takes two minutes and a team's message for me to generate in the team. So absolutely has changed the paradigm. So we need variants that are functional in large samples and deeply phenotyped. If only we had half a million whole genomes. So what do we find when we look at whole genome sequencing in half a million individuals? We identify 1.1 billion variants, a very large proportion of which are new. And of course, we cover a vast majority of those are outside the coding genome. 
But even in the coding genome, despite the fact that we already have whole exome sequencing in a large proportion of UK biobank, we find in excess of 120,000 high confidence putative loss of function variants. And the figure that I'm showing there in yellow, you see the number of variants across each of those classes in um, the exomes data. We've then downsampled the whole genome sequencing data down to the same number of individuals that were sampled in the exomes, and you find increasing coverage because of better capture of the exons. But then, of course, this whole genome sequencing has been done in a slightly larger sample in the entire cohort, so we find that 120,000 more high confidence loss of functions. And if we compare that to the imputed array data, we find 20 times more um, genetic variants than we do in the imputed array. Now, to set expectation, that 20-fold increase in variant capture does not translate to a 20-fold increase in novel biology, but nevertheless, there are, there are signals there to be found. One other point to come to is the fact that we find, of course, European samples predominate there, um, but we find a large number of novel variants in even the, the modest um, non-European samples. So this figure shows um, on the y-axis the number of genes and on the x-axis the number of individuals. I'd maybe draw your attention to two points on this. One is the top set of lines. So in red, we see the whole genome sequences and in blue, the whole exomes. We're, we're now saturating the number of genes that in Europeans we can identify with individual single carriers of heterozygous loss of function variants. But as we go down and we look to, to finding um, variants that are carried by um, 100 individuals, you can see, number one is we increase the number of sequences we do, we're going to find more and more genes that we can capture a large number of um, loss of function variants. And the difference between the blue line and the red line is the difference between exomes and genomes. And you can find that carrying in this sample size um, um, loss of function variants in 100 individuals, we instrument 2,000 more genes using genomes than we do exomes. Shown here, European samples predominate, but the thing I would highlight is that even in these relatively modest sample sizes of non-Europeans, we still make a material addition to the coverage of whole genome sequencing in diverse ancestries. Um, and even in these relatively modest um, sample sizes, unique insights are available. So we can see things in these samples that one does not see in Europeans. And in this particular case, there's well-trodden biology linking um, HBB to thalassemia, but in this instance we find a rare splice variant in this particular gene that's associated very, very strongly with thalassemia that's not present in either the exomes data or in the European samples. <clears throat> and I recognize I'm going quickly here, but I will point you to the paper in which many of these data are shown um, if you're not able to squint fast enough. So this figure shows the number of new insights that we see grouped by allele frequency. If we look in Europeans, how does that considerable increase in variant capture relate to the number of novel signals that we identify? So on the rightmost side, you see in the pink color, um, the number of associations are already observed in the imputed array data. And the blue sliver at the top is that extra 2% of associations that we find using the whole genome sequencing. Now, that's no surprise, the fact we capture common variants well, but we see a, a small gain. When we look at the associations observed at the rarest allele frequencies, we find that the vast majority are unique to the whole genome sequencing data, which again is to be expected. These fall into a few categories. I show an example here for an association with um, cataracts where we find a, a rare frame shift variant in the lowermost plot that shows the coverage in whole genome sequences completely hidden in both the imputed and the whole exome um, data. We then see even amongst common variants, so the topmost plot there is showing the, the regional plot for the imputed array data, we find that there's a gap in imputation quality there that now has been filled in through improved um, genome reference build and the, the comprehensive capture of variants. And we find then again a novel signal in this particular region associated with hypothyroidism. It was completely hidden. The minor allele frequency here is about 25%. So we're seeing new common signals. We also, this comprehensive capture allows us to identify novel rare variant button signals, even in the exons, capturing variants that were not pre present in those data. 
And maybe one of the more interesting analyses is we, of course, now can, can do aggregate tests not only in the coding region, but also in the non-coding. And this allows us for one of the first times to identify these non-coding variant, rare variant aggregations in the, in the untranslated regions. The ones in orange are the ones that are completely unique to these tests and not observed in the exons. A final scientific slide here is Clearly, we, as these data will be even more valuable as our ability to capture these categories of, of non-coding functionality improves. One of the ways we can do that is using the 50,000 proteomics measures that have been done in UK Biobank to directly ask, is a rare variant associated with protein levels? We can then define custom masks that aggregate these variants. And when we do that, in the blue, we're finding the, the negative log 10 p-value for association using those custom masks relative to those using conventional annotations. These are really preliminary analyses, but point to the fact that there's lots of novel biology yet to be uncovered here. Um, so rather flippantly, I'll ask, but well, apart from the novel variants, the novel associations and the coding and the non-coding genome, the novel biology, what have half a million genomes ever done for us? I would say nine months in, we're barely scratching the surface. It's gone fast. And I think this is utterly transformative into the future. And we'll further embed UK Biobank as the world's premier biomedical resource. Huge number of individuals to thank for this, not least the visionary leadership at UK Biobank, the staff and team that make that possible, but also the other funding partners that made this possible. And of course, the participants. I'll point you there to the paper that I mentioned that was so fantastically led by colleagues across industry and the colleagues at GSK with whom it's a privilege to work. Thank you. Thank you.